Robert Edward Crane was born on July 13, 1928 and played a natural talent for entertainment. As a teenager, he found solace and expression through music, becoming an accomplished drummer. His first drum set, a gift from his parents, ignited a passion that would lead him to perform in local bands during his high school years. Little did he know, this passion for the arts paved the way for his future stardom. In the early 1950s, Bob Crane's career began to take shape. He started as a radio host in New York, where his charisma and quick wit quickly got the attention of listeners. His engaging personality and knack for storytelling made his show a hit. However, it was his move to Los Angeles that marked a significant turning point. At KNX CBS Radio, Crane's morning show became a local sensation. His ability to connect with the audience and his comedic timing made him a beloved figure in Los Angeles radio. Bob's big break arrived when he was cast as Colonel Robert Hogan in the television sitcom Hogan's Heroes. The show, set in a German POW camp during World War II, was a hit. Bob's portrayal of the clever and charismatic Colonel Hogan won the hearts of millions. For six seasons, Hogan Heroes dominated the airwaves, making Bob Crane a household name. The show's unique blend of comedy and wartime drama resonated with audiences, and Crane's performance was a major contributing factor to its success. Crane's comedic timing and ability to bring a lightheartedness to an otherwise serious setting of a POW camp made Hogan's Heroes a standout show of its time. His character's witty banter and leadership resonated with viewers, and Crane's charm was undeniable. The role of Colonel Hogan not only showcased his acting ability, but also allowed him to display his comedic talent, which he honed during his years in radio. However, Bob Crane's acting career extended beyond Hogan's heroes. After the show ended in 1971, Crane sought to diversify his roles and shake off the typecasting that came along with the iconic character. He appeared in a variety of television shows and films, albeit with limited success compared to his role as Colonel Hogan. Some of his notable post-Hogan's Heroes appearances included guest roles on popular TV shows such as The Love Boat, Police Woman, and Quincy M.E. Despite his efforts to branch out, Crane often found himself pigeonholed by his association with Hogan's Heroes. In addition to television, Bob Crane also ventured into the world of theater. He toured extensively with several stage productions, demonstrating his versatility as an actor. One of his most notable stage roles was in the play Beginner's Luck, a comedy that he performed in various regional theaters across the United States. Although the play did not receive widespread acclaim, it allowed Crane to continue working in the entertainment industry and connect with live audiences. Despite these efforts, Crane struggled to find a role that matched the success of Colonel Hogan. The transition from a successful television series to new roles was challenging for Crane. He found himself typecast as Colonel Hogan, making it difficult to secure parts that showcased his range as an actor. This frustration with being typecast added to the pressure he faced in his personal and professional life. Bob Crane's career in the entertainment industry was marked by both remarkable success and significant challenges. His portrayal of Colonel Hogan remains his most enduring legacy, a testament to his talent and charisma. However, his attempts to move beyond that role highlight the difficulties many actors face in the industry that often typecast them based on their most famous performances. Crane's career, with its highs and lows, provides a poignant backdrop to the tragic events that would later unfold in his life. While Bob Crane's professional life soared, his personal life was far more complex. Behind the scenes, Bob was a man of many layers. He was married twice first to Anne Terzian, with whom he had three children. However, the pressure of fame and Bob's personal demons led to their divorce. Crane's rise to fame came with its share of temptations and challenges. The strain of balancing a demanding career with family life took its toll, leading to tensions that ultimately ended his first marriage. In 1970, Bob married a second wife, Patricia Olson, who was also known by her stage name, Sigrid Valdez. Patricia played Hilda on Hogan's Heroes, and the two developed a close bond on and off screen. They had a son together, but Bob's personal struggles continued to overshadow his relationships. The couple's relationship, though passionate, was also tumultuous. Friends and colleagues noted that Crane's fame and his struggles with personal vices created an undercurrent of tension in his marriage. Bob Crane's fascination with photography and videography was well known among his friends and colleagues. 
he often documented his life meticulously, capturing moments on camera. However, his hobby took a darker dimension. Crane's interest in photography extended beyond mere hobbyism. He was known for his extensive collection of cameras and recording equipment. He meticulously cataloged his recordings, which often included explicit material that raised eyebrows among those who knew him. Crane's journey into the world of videography began innocently enough. He initially used his equipment to document family events, vacations, and moments from his professional life. However, as his interest grew, it took a more controversial nature. Bob Crane became deeply involved in recording his intimate encounters with various women, a practice that many found disturbing. This aspect of his life was kept largely private, known only to a close circle of friends and confidants. One of the key figures in this private aspect of Crane's life was John Henry Carpenter, an electronics expert and video equipment sales manager for Sony. Carpenter's professional expertise and access to the latest video technology made him an invaluable ally for Crane's endeavors. The two men shared a mutual interest in videography and often collaborated on setting up recording equipment. The relationship, however, was more than just a professional alliance. It was marked by a shared interest in exploring and documenting their intimate escapades. Crane's hobby for recording his intimate encounters created a complex and controversial personal life. His home was filled with sophisticated video equipment, including cameras, monitors, and editing gear. He meticulously organized his recordings, labeling and storing them with great care. Friends and acquaintances who visited Crane's home were often taken back by the sheer volume of video equipment and tapes. Some found it intriguing, while others were disturbed by the extent of his hobby. The nature of Crane's recording and his relationship with Carpenter raised many questions. While some viewed it as an expression of a modern man's fascination with technology and eroticism, others saw it as a troubling indication of deeper issues. The recordings often involved multiple partners, including women Crane met through his work in the entertainment industry. There were whispers and rumors about Crane's lifestyle, but he maintained a public persona that was largely separate from his private activities. Crane's behavior also strained his relationship with his children. His three children from his first marriage to Anne Terziam had a complicated relationship with their father. They admired his talent and success, but were often troubled by his personal choices and the impact that it had on the family. The duality of Crane's life, his public image as a charming and talented actor, and his private indulges created a dichotomy that was difficult for those close to him to reconcile. In addition to his videotape and activities, Crane's private life included a series of extramarital affairs and encounters. He frequented nightclubs and social events, often in the company of Carpenter, where they would meet women and invite them back to Crane's home. This behavior became a well-known secret among those in the entertainment industry, adding to the controversial image that Crane was developing behind the scenes. Crane's darker interests and controversial hobbies cast a long shadow over his life and career. They revealed a side of him that was at odds with his public persona. The tapes, the equipment, and his relationship with Carpenter became central to the narrative of his private life, leaving a legacy that was complex and enigmatic as the man himself. As Crane's private life became more widely known, the tapes and his relationship with Carpenter drew intense scrutiny. The explicit nature of the tapes shocked many and led to widespread speculation about Crane's personal life. Friends, colleagues, and fans struggled to reconcile the charming and talented actor they knew with the darker aspects of his personal life that the tapes revealed. On the night of June 28, 1978, Bob Crane was in Scottsdale, Arizona, performing in a play called Beginner's Luck. He had been touring with the play, hoping to rejuvenate his career. The play, a lighthearted comedy, provided Crane with the opportunity to connect with live audiences and demonstrate his versatility as an actor. Despite the mixed reviews, Crane remained optimistic, believing this could be the start of a career resurgence. That evening, after a successful performance, Crane decided to unwind. He was also known for having a social side, often enjoying nights out after his performances. On this particular night, Crane made plans to meet up with his friend, John Carpenter, who was also in Scottsdale on business. The two had spent many such evenings together, and this night seemed no different. Crane and Carpenter headed to Bobby McGee's, a popular local restaurant and nightclub. The establishment was known for its lively atmosphere, and the duo quickly blended into the crowd. Witnesses later recalled seeing them at the bar, laughing and talking animately. They seemed to be in high spirits, enjoying each other's company and the vibrant nightlife. 
As the night progressed, Crane and Carpenter were seen engaging with other patrons, a common occurrence given Crane's charismatic nature. His fame often attracted attention, and he was comfortable in social settings, frequently charming those around him. Carpenter, who was more reserved, usually stayed in the background but seemed at ease in Crane's presence. After a few hours at Bobby McGee's, Crane and Carpenter decided to call it a night. They left the club together and headed back to Crane's apartment at the Winfield Place Apartments. The complex was a quiet, upscale location that provided a degree of privacy that Crane appreciated. It was around 2 a.m. when they arrived, and according to Carpenter, they both retired for the night soon after. The following morning, June 29th, Crane was scheduled to have lunch with his co-star, Victoria Berry. When he failed to show up and didn't respond to calls, Berry became concerned. She decided to go to Crane's apartment to check on him. When she got there, she noticed that his car was still in the parking lot, which increased her anxiety. Barry knocked on the door, but received no answer. After several attempts, she decided to enter the apartment, fearing the worst. What she discovered inside was a scene of unimaginable horror. Crane's lifeless body lay in his bed, brutally bludgeoned. Blood splattered on the walls and bedding, indicating a violent struggle. An electrical cord was found wrapped around his neck, adding a grim detail to an already gruesome scene. In a state of shock, Barry immediately called the Scottsdale police, who arrived quickly. The officers who responded were met with a chaotic and bloody crime scene. It was clear that Crane had been attacked while he slept, caught off guard by his assailant. The brutal nature of the crime stunned the investigators, who quickly realized that they were dealing with a highly unusual and violent murder. The initial investigation focused on physical evidence available at the scene. The murder weapon, suspected to be a camera tripod, was never found, but the nature of Crane's injuries suggested a heavy, blunt object was used. Blood splattered analysis indicated that the attack was swift and brutal, leaving Crane with little chance to defend himself. Detectives canvassed the area, speaking with neighbors, and examining security footage from the apartment complex. They also interviewed Victoria Berry extensively, trying to piece together Crane's activities in the hours leading up to his death. Berry recounted Crane's plans for the evening, his performance, and his habit for socializing after shows and her account also confirmed that Carpenter was with Crane the previous night. John Carpenter quickly became a person of interest. Investigators found it suspicious that he was one of the last people to see Crane alive and had spent the night at a nearby hotel. Carpenter was cooperative, but visibly nervous during his initial questioning. He claimed to have returned to his motel room after leaving Crane's apartment and had no knowledge of the murder. Despite Carpenter's cooperation, the investigators found inconsistencies in his story. They obtained a warrant to search Carpenter's rental car, hoping to find any physical evidence that might link him to the crime. During the search, they discovered a photograph that appeared to show a small smudge on the car door, which some experts believe could be brain tissue. This discovery heightened their suspicions, but the forensic analysis was inconclusive. With Carpenter under scrutiny, the police sought to understand the nature of his relationship with Crane. Friends and acquaintances described Carpenter as a close confidant who shared Crane's interest in videography. Their collaboration on recording equipment and their shared carnal exploits were well known among the circle, adding a layer of complexity to the investigation. The detectives faced a challenging task. While circumstantial evidence pointed towards Carpenter, concrete forensic evidence was lacking. They conducted extensive interviews with Crane's friends, colleagues, and acquaintances, exploring various theories and potential motives. One theory suggested Carpenter may have been motivated by jealousy or rejection as Crane had recently expressed a desire to distance himself with their shared lifestyle. The media quickly picked up on the sensational aspect of Crane's private life. Reporters uncovered details about his controversial videotaping activities and his extensive collection of explicit recordings. The scandalous revelations dominated headlines, casting a shadow over Crane's public image as a beloved television star. The revelations about Crane's extensive collection of explicit videos and his habit of recording his intimate encounters added a layer of scandal to the case. Despite their efforts, the police struggled to find a definitive link between Carpenter and the murder. They also explored other potential suspects, including individuals from Crane's past relationships and professional circles. However, these avenues yielded little progress. The complexity of Crane's personal life, combined with the lack of physical evidence, made it difficult to pin down a single suspect. As the months passed, the case grew increasingly cold. The initial flurry of investigation activity slowed, and leads became scarce. 
The Scottsdale police faced mounting frustration as they struggled to bring the case to a resolution. The high-profile nature of the murder, combined with the salacious detail of Crane's private life, made it a challenging and complex investigation. The cloud of suspicion hanging over John Carpenter remained. Although he was never formally charged in the initial stages of the investigation, his association with Crane and the inconsistencies in his story kept him in the spotlight. The case remained open but stagnant, with the police hoping that new evidence or advances in forensic technology might one day provide the breakthrough they needed. In the meantime, the murder of Bob Crane continued to captivate public interest. The combination of a beloved television star's brutal death, the scandalous revelation of his private life, and the unresolved questions surrounding the case ensured that it remained a topic of discussion and speculation. The investigation into Crane's murder became one of Hollywood's most enduring mysteries, a tragic tale of fame, controversy, and unanswered questions. For years, the case remained dormant. Leads dried up, and without new evidence, the momentum slowed. John Carpenter, despite being the prime suspect, continued to maintain his innocence and was not charged. As time passed, the high-profile nature of the murder, along with the salacious details of Crane's private life, faded from the public eye. The once vibrant investigation turned into a cold case, shelled along countless others that awaited breakthroughs that might never come. It wasn't until the early 1990s that renewed interest in the case began to stir. Advances in forensic technology, particularly in DNA analysis, provided a glimmer of hope that new evidence could be uncovered. Scottsdale police, alongside Crane's family and friends, harbored a lingering desire for justice. With the passage of time, new perspectives and techniques were applied to the case files. In 1990, a forensic re-examination of the evidence was initiated. The aim was to review all the material collected from the crime scene and reanalyze it with the latest technology. This renewed effort was driven by the hope that advances in forensic science could provide the breakthrough that had eluded investigators for over a decade. One of the primary focuses was the controversial photograph of the smudge found on Carpenter's rental car. Although the original sample had been lost, the photograph itself remained. Forensic experts re-examined the image with modern techniques, hoping to extract new insights. The potential presence of brain tissue on the car door was reconsidered, and while the findings remained inconclusive, it added weight to the theory that Carpenter might still be connected to the crime. Additionally, investigators revisited the physical evidence from Crane's apartment. Blood samples, hair fibers, and other materials collected from the scene were subject to new DNA testing methods. This process was painstaking and required meticulous handing of the aging evidence. Unfortunately, the results yielded no new information, as the samples were either too degraded or insufficient for conclusive DNA profiling. Despite these setbacks, the renewed investigation did uncover some previously unlooked details. Investigators conducted fresh interviews with witnesses and acquaintances of Crane and Carpenter. They hoped with the passage of time, individuals might be more willing to come forward with the information that they had previously withheld out of fear or loyalty. This renewed focus on witness testimony led to some intriguing developments. New witnesses emerged, providing additional context to Crane and Carpenter's relationship. Some stated that Crane had grown increasingly uneasy about his association with Carpenter and had expressed a desire to end their friendship. This potential riff was seen as a possible motive for Carpenter to have committed the crime in a fit of rage or desperation. The investigation also delved deeper into Crane's controversial videotaping activities. Detectives reviewed hours of explicit footage searching for any clues that might point to a motive or suspect. They considered the possibility that Crane had inadvertently recorded something incriminating leading to his murder. However, this line of inquiry, while provocative, did not yield any definitive evidence. In 1992, the Scottsdale police felt they had enough circumstantial evidence to charge John Carpenter with the murder of Bob Crane. Carpenter was arrested and charged, leading to a highly publicized trial in 1994. The prosecution's case hinged on the motive of jealousy and rejection, as well as a suspicious smudge found on Carpenter's rental car. They argued that Carpenter, feeling spurned by Kane, had lashed out in a violent fit of rage. The defense, however, highlighted the lack of concrete forensic evidence linking Carpenter to the crime. They pointed to the inconsistencies and the gaps in the investigation, emphasizing that the case was built largely in circumstantial evidence. Carpenter's attorneys argued that there was no direct proof that he had been at the scene of the murder 
or that he committed the crime. The trial was a media spectacle drawing significant public attention. Friends and colleagues of Crane testified, painting a complex picture of his personal life and his relationship with Carpenter. The courtroom drama unfolded over several weeks, with both sides presenting compelling arguments. However, in the end, the jury found Carpenter not guilty due to the lack of definitive evidence. Carpenter's acquittal was a significant blow to the investigation. Many believed he escaped justice due to the prosecution's inability to present a compelling case. The verdict left lingering doubts and questions, fueling further speculation and debate about the true circumstances of Bob Crane's murder. In the years following the trial, the Scottsdale police continued to periodically review the case. Advances in forensic technology and new investigative techniques kept the hope alive that one day a breakthrough might be achieved. Despite the setbacks, the case remained open, a testament to the enduring desire to find justice for Bob Crane. In the years following the trial, numerous theories have emerged about who might have killed Bob Crane. Some suggest that Crane's murder was a result of a botched robbery, while others believe it was a crime of passion committed by an unknown lover or an acquaintance. There are even those who propose that Crane's death was linked to his involvement in the underground world of erotica and that powerful figures in the industry might have wanted to keep him silent. One theory posits that Crane's murder was the work of a professional hitman, hired by someone with a personal vendetta or a financial motive. This theory suggests that Crane's extensive videotaping of his erotic encounters may have captured something incriminating leading to his death. However, no evidence has surfaced to support this claim. Another theory speculates that Crane's murder was a result of a jealous lover seeking revenge. Crane's numerous affairs and complex relationships created a web of potential suspects, any of whom might have a motive to kill him. However, this theory also lacked concrete evidence, and no suspects have ever been identified. Despite the many theories and ongoing interest in the case, the murder of Bob Crane remains unsolved, hoping that new evidence or advances in forensic science might one day provide answers needed to bring closure to this tragic chapter in Hollywood history. Bob Crane's story is a cautionary tale about the pearls of fame and the dark side of human nature. His rise to stardom was marked by vast talent and charm, but his personal demons and controversial lifestyle cast a shadow over his legacy. The mystery of his murder continues to captivate and intrigue, serving as a reminder that even the brightest stars can fall prey to the darkest forces. As we look back on Crane's life and the unanswered questions surrounding his death, we're left to ponder the complexities of human relationships and the fragile nature of trust. The search for justice in Crane's murder may never be fully realized, but his story will continue to be told, ensuring that the enigmatic and tragic figure of Bob Crane remains in our collective memory. Crane's dual life, his public persona as a beloved actor, and his private indulges created a narrative that has intrigued and puzzled both fans and investigators. His murder remains one of Hollywood's most enduring mysteries, a case that continues to baffle and fascinate decades after his untimely death. In the end, Bob Crane's legacy is a complex tapestry of triumph and tragedy, talent and turmoil. His story serves as a reminder of the often harsh realities behind the glitz and the glamour of Hollywood, and the unresolved questions surrounding his murder ensure that his name will not be forgotten. The enigma of his death, much like the man himself, remains a captivated and tragic chapter in the annals of entertainment history. Thanks for watching Legends and Legacies. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this. Have a great day everyone, and see you next time.